Salty Pie, A Chuck Todd Journey from Darkness into Light by Tim Tingle, illustrated by Karen Clarkson. A bee sting on the bottom. Who could ever forget a bee sting on the bottom? Not me. I felt the sting, slapped my pants, and ran to the wooded bench in the grape arbor. I sat there crying till Mama, my grandmother, came and sat beside me. Didn't you hear the bees? she asked. No, I said, wiping my eyes. We sat still as dawn. After a moment, I could hear the bees buzzing and humming in Mama's white gardenias. That was some kind of salty pie, that bee sting, Mama said. She smiled her sweet smile and laughed her sweet laugh till everything hurtful went away. A soft breeze blew in. Mama stood up, and in that shuffling way she had of walking, she moved towards the chicken house, calling over her shoulder, chickens need feeding. Chick, chick, chickens, Mama called out. Hundreds of chickens came running, and we tossed feed into the air. We filled a tin bucket with eggs and carried them to a small room in the back of the garage where my papa had built a light board. He had replaced a porcelain tabletop with glass and wired four light bulbs under it. When Mama flipped the switch, shafts of yellow light rose to the ceiling. Mama placed the eggs on the table. I rolled them over and over, looking closely for blood spots on the yellow yolks. There's one, Mama, I shouted. I handed the egg to my grandmother. She held it close to her eyes. You're a good boy, she said, laughing her quiet, funny laugh, like there was so much more to laugh at than you would ever know. That's some kind of salty pie for those chicken eggs, boy, she said, tossing the bad egg into the trash bucket. My grandmother was a strong and special Choctaw woman. Everyone who knew her knew that. In 1915, when my father was almost two years old, my family left Oklahoma. They moved to Pasadena, Texas, to a white wooden house on Strawberry Lane. The first morning in her new home, my grandmother stepped quietly on the front porch to greet the dawn. She never saw the boy who threw the stone that cut her face. It sent her stumbling inside the house, slamming the door behind her. She slid against the surface of the pine door and crumpled into a heap onto the floor, sobbing. My father was two at the time. He ran to see his mother sitting on the floor, her hands covering her face. It looked like the peep eye game to him. He crawled into her lap and saw shiny red liquid squishing between her fingertips. It reminded him of sweet cherry pie filling, bubbling up from the crisscross crust of Mama's pies. He reached to her face to get a taste of it, then touched his fingertip to his lips. Salty pie, he said, spitting as he said it, salty pie. Mama pulled her hands apart and held her little boy close. Salty pie, she said, nodding her head. That sure was some kind of salty pie. Then she started laughing, laughing and crying, rocking back and forth and saying, sure enough, that was some kind of salty pie with those rocks. Some kind of salty pie, boy. At the supper table that night, Mama laughed when she told Papa what had happened. You should have seen our little boy, she said. Salty pie, that's what he said, salty pie. I'll find out who did this, Papa said, rising from the table. Mama grabbed his arm and said, Your going won't do any good. I never saw the boy who threw the stone. In 1954, when I was six years old, Mama and Papa still lived in that same house, the house of the yellow jacket bees, one morning, Papa told me I could have my own cup of coffee for breakfast. I sat next to him while Mama circled the table, filling the cups. Mama put her thumb in my Papa's empty cup and poured the coffee. Then she shook the hot coffee from her thumb, licked her thumb, and put it in the next cup. When she came to me, I put my hand over my cup. I didn't want her thumb in my cup. Everybody stopped talking. A chair scraped. I looked up and saw my Aunt Bobby coming for me. I sat frozen in fear. Aunt Bobby scooped me from the chair and carried me to the back porch. I expected a whipping. She gripped my arm and I made a scrunching face. Nothing happened. I opened my eyes. 
You don't know, do you? She said. I shook my head. Bless your heart, she said. You don't know. Your grandmother is blind. That's why she puts her thumb in the coffee cup, so she'll know when the coffee is full. I couldn't believe it. I was six years old, and I didn't know my grandmother was blind. Aunt Bobby smiled. Just go back in there and let your grandmother do what she has to do. That night, at the evening talk time, I asked my Uncle Kenneth, why is Mama blind? Her eyes went bad. Something she was born with caught up with her, he said. You know, your Mama has had a hard time, but she's happy now. She's a strong woman, stronger than that boy with the stone, don't you think? You bet, I said. But who threw the stone? I don't reckon we'll ever know who did that, Uncle Kenneth said. That was some kind of salty pie, that stone in your Mama. He sat without talking for a long time. We listened to the sounds of chickens roosting. At Mama's, it always seemed that if you waited quietly, you could know things that ought to be known, hidden in the sounds. Why did they throw the stone? Your grandmother was Indian. That was enough back then, my uncle said. A mosquito buzzed around my ear. I started to slap it. But a little breeze blew up, carrying the mosquito off and washing the backyard with the soft music of rustling cornstalks. What is salty pie? I asked him. It's a way of dealing with trouble, son. Sometimes you don't know where the trouble comes from. You just kind of shrug it off, say salty pie. It helps you carry on. I fell asleep that night to the sweet aroma of gardenias, blooming white and tucked real close to the house. The years passed by taking forever. In 1970, I was a junior in college. I was studying for an exam when the phone rang. Your grandmother is in the hospital, Aunt Bobby said. Come right away. I drove four hours to the hospital and dashed inside. The waiting room was filled with people sitting and standing everywhere. The whole Tingle clan was gathered together. My father stood to greet me. Your grandmother is having an eye transplant, he told me. We may be waiting for days before the doctors know anything. We did wait for days, catching up on news and laughing at old stories, as families do. About an hour before sundown on the fourth day, the doctor stepped among us. We'll know soon, he said. A quiet but remarkable change occurred in the room. The light streaming through the window took on a copper glow, floating above the green waiting room carpet. It reminded me of the late afternoon sun in Mama's backyard. The spirit of who we were as a Choctaw family was coming alive in the room. We could almost hear the cicadas hum their night music in the Choctaw River bottoms of years ago. The stories continued, but there were fewer words now and much silent nodding. Many heads were bowed to the moment. My uncle Boyd told about how hard it had been for Mama as a little girl at Indian boarding school. Tuscahoma Academy in Oklahoma, especially after her father died and there was nobody to take her home for Christmas. We listened like we, we were all sharing the same sweet dream for over an hour, till everybody had spoken except my father. He stood up and took off his cap, twisting it in front of him. He was shy and kept us waiting for a long time. The doctor peered through the door and motioned to him. They spoke in the hallway, and my father returned. It was so right that my father, who had given us this word fifty years ago in a moment of childhood misunderstanding, would now take it away in a moment of enlightenment. He lifted his eyes and spoke. No more salty pie, he said. Mama can see. It seemed like all of Mama's troubles and all of our Choctaw troubles had led up to this moment. No more salty pie. Your grandmother can see. The next morning, Aunt Bobby lined up all 32 of the grandchildren, myself and my cousins, outside of Mama's hospital room. Your grandmother wants to guess who each of you are, she said. That's when I realized Mama had never seen any of her grandchildren. Aunt Bobby hugged us one at a time and whispered, When you enter the room, be sure to tiptoe. If you walk in your usual walk, she will know who you are by the sound of your footfall. That is the real blessing of my grandmother. Blind as she was, she taught so many how to see. We all leave footfalls everywhere we go. We change the people we meet. 
If we learn to listen to the quiet and secret music as my mama did, we will leave happy footfalls behind us in our going.